what the heck happened today? All right, so the market, the Dow was down 1,000 points. You shouldn't really pay much mind to the Dow. But even that, the S&P was down like, what, 2.5 or something like that. The S&P was down uh, how much? 2.3%, uh, NASDAQ 34 Treasuries are up. That's just freaking weird to me. The treasuries are up. Small caps, three. In. I mean, so it's a lot. Uh, we, we got a lot of red other than the treasuries. I thought the treasuries would just tank today. I mean, when I say tank, the yields tank, the price going up, and uh, it didn't happen. It's kind of weird. So what happened? So I'm going to start with my man, uh, Brian Westbury, over here at uh, First Trust, who I'm a big fan of, and I, uh, I will just see what he says. Both inflation and economic growth are decelerating. Consumer prices declined 0.1% in June, the largest drop for any month since the early days of the pandemic. Much of this is due to a decline in energy prices. Huh, who's been saying that for years? Oh, your old buddy Josh and his t-shirt and his not shaved face and his pearly yellows. And please don't forget to fondle the like button. You know, just give it a little tweak. Say, hey, you know, just fondle it. Mansplain to the like, the like button, how you find the like button attractive and you'd like to go on a date. Just fondle it. Say, hi, like button. Go ahead and fondle that like button, will you? And then, of course, if you do fondle, let me know that you fondle it, too, because the fondling of the like button, and you tell me that you fondled the like button, this guy said that in my last video, it cracked me up, uh, is good for the algorithm, the uh, imperial algorithm. So let's keep going here. We're seeing more and more softness in the economy. The housing sector remains mired in slow construction and sales. The dollar value of new private housing is down each year, each of the last past three months. Recent home sales are near the lowest level since housing bust of 2010. Wow. Uh, new home sales are lower than they were during COVID. And here we go right here. The National Int uh, International Supply Managers, whatever the hell is it, ISM Manufacturing Index came in at 46.8 for July, below the forecast from every economics group. Uh, which says if it's below 50, it's in contraction. Above 50, it's in contraction. All right, so it declined to its lowest level since the lockdown. And then we got a tepid jaw growth of 85,000, which means just 17,000 were in the private sector. And now we're at 4.3% unemployment. So here's where it gets interesting. It's true that the M2 measure of money uh, bottomed out in October of last year. That's 10 months ago. The M2 money supply bottomed out 10 months ago. And it's been trending upward ever since. But the gain since then has only been 2.4%, much slower than the 6.1% annualized average in the 20 years leading up to COVID. I, oh my goodness, this is what drives you so crazy. Do you hear what Brian's saying? We've averaged 6.1% increase annually in the money supply 20 years previous to COVID. That's from 2000 to 2020. And what happened to inflation? Yeah, very low. But no one puts two together. It's the weirdest thing, man. Uh, let's see. Hey, right here. And at a time when the CPI gained a moderate of 2.1%. So the money supply was going at three, growing at three times the inflation rate. So, you know, we just keep going because I get frustrated by this. It's weird. Um, right here. Put it all together, decelerating inflation and decelerating growth along with a nor abnormally slow re rebound in M2. Strong case that the Federal Reserve has implemented a tight policy, but they don't have a tight policy. Because they're still growing the M2. They're not reducing it. It's growing by 2.4% annually. I, 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 it's weird to me, man. It says the Fed needs to start focusing on money supply, uh, particularly on M2, uh, as, as opposed to cutting short-term rates. And then this is what I like about Brian. Now, I, I, I just, the whole thing with M2 drives up the wall. I'll show you here in a second. There is a widespread myth that the 1980s Paul, uh, Fed Chairman Paul Volcker beat inflation by sharply raising short-term rates. Who has destroyed that? Oh, your old buddy Josh has destroyed that. Just me and my t-shirt, my dogs, and my unshaved beard. What Volcker did was uh, focus on the money supply and getting it under growth of control, uh, getting his growth under control. That meant the Fed was using open market operations to soak up excess liquidity and those operations which resulted in high short-term rates and lower inflation. I, I, okay, we'll see about that here in a second. Uh, if he could have, all right, right here. The problem is that Today, the current Fed has abandoned the focus on the money supply and has swapped a system of scarce reserves for one of which reserves are excessively abundant, which means short-term interest rates are directly controlled by the government. Well, oh, my goodness. But, Brian, if short-term interest rates are directly controlled by the government and not the market, then how do you freaking – I mean, I completely agree with that. It's the way it's always been. But then we look at long-term rates right here. So I'm going, to, I'm going to show you here. I mean, that that is true. 100%. Short-term rates are controlled by the Federal Reserve. It always been. The Fed raises the rate, short-term rates go up. The Fed lowers the rate, short-term rates go down. But here we got a 10-year a Treasury right there, 
3.7 is the yield on the 10 year treasury. <laughs> Here's the long term treasury, the, uh, the 30 year treasury, four, just barely over four. So the market is controlling the long term rates significantly lower than the short term rates. The federal government controls the short, but they've always controlled the short. It's, a weird, it's just weird to me, man. And finally, there's a real potential here for the Fed to overreact. Uh, okay, yeah, 100%. But I just want to show you something here. It's, uh, here's St. Louis Fed, uh, the Fred, Federal Reserve uh, data. Um, right here, and you can see going back to 1960 or really 1958, and people say, look, there's hardly any increase in monetary supply until right there in 2010. And all of a sudden, whoop, and then went, whoop. And people, but you got to, again, as I always say, you got to freaking log this. The log it says how much it increased from year to year as a percentage of the increase. So we're going to format, we're going to log this right there, and you're going to see, do I click on it? Oh, there we go, uh, right there. So you see a, a little bit of a bump right there. I mean, it's just basically like a zit, if you will, but not much. You see it's been pretty level the whole time, pretty level the whole time. I just So this idea that the Federal Reserve has, I just, where is, where is the decrease in the money supply in, from 19, when Paul Volcker took over as a chairman? Wait, it's 78, I think, is when he took over, maybe 79. Where is the decrease in the money supply? It's not there. It's not. You can see it's just going up. Now, it did level off here when the Republicans took over the Congress with Clinton in office. But on that, it's been this a steady increase each and every year, even during the, the aughts, even during Obama. It's just a steady increase. So that you can't say the money supply is what's causing inflation, causing deflation, causing economic uh, increases, economic downturns. You just can't. Can you say it's the interest rates? No, because the interest rates assume that people are borrowing. And we know about the Japanese recession, the 30-year recession, that just because you have low interest rates, if people aren't borrowing, I say people, in this case, corporations, they're not, if they're not borrowing, they're not generating economic activity by freaking the leverage. They're just not. <laughs> so what else causes it? What else is causes it? It's a decline in earnings, man. Earnings growth. This is what's happening, for sure. The earnings growth are declining. And you can attribute one of that to debt. Oh, my goodness, they're paying 5% from short-term money where before they were paying 0.1. How much debt does some of these companies have? I mean, Apple's got a crap load of cash, you know, more cash than they can know what to do with. And so that cash that they have on the side is freaking paying them 5% right now. So they can easily pay off all their debt and still be, be debt-free. So, so if anything, the interest rate is increasing their earnings. But either way, the facts are earnings are dropping. As always, if you look at, oh, I need my little whiteboard. If you look at what drives stocks, it's earning growth plus dividend yield. And you got to throw in share buybacks now, but earnings growth plus dividend yield. Plus or minus people's reactions in terms of their ability to, uh, to, to pay more for a dollar of earnings or pay less. Contraction or expansion of P.E. ratios. That's what's going on. The earnings growth are going down. People get nervous. They're also going to have an alternative investment called cash that's paying five, but they're going to lower the rates. What, to five to four? Okay, still better than losing your money. And I just don't think people get it. This whole thing, this this guy posts my YouTube channel, Paul Volcker raised rates and that destroyed inflation. I was like, what, how come I didn't? Let's look at the 10-year uh, treasury. I don't feel like looking any harder. But anyway, the facts were they were raising rates like crazy in the mid to late 70s, and that did not stop inflation. All right, they were. And I just showed you the M2 money supply. It was still growing at a pretty significant clip each and every year. And so they, they didn't stop inflation by increasing the interest rates. They didn't stop inflation by reducing the M2 money supply. Where's the evidence of that? They did it, man. So how do they stop inflation? Oh, we already talked about that because the price of energy went down significantly because of deregulation. I just, it's just, there's just no two ways around it. That's what stopped inflation. But everyone in their mom says, oh, it's Paul Volcker. It just wasn't, man. And then on top of that, I just gotta say something else here too. Check this out. The stock market was overvalued and unemployment artificially low. The stock market wasn't that highly overvalued. It's not. The PEs are not over, off, they're not nosebleed out of 1999. The Fed thinks that it's normal to try to add more money than needed and risk creating stagflation, uh, just like it did in the 1970s. The Fed wasn't the cause of the stag. I just, oh my goodness. It wasn't, the, it was the price of energy, the OPEC, all this, the oil stuff. That was the cause of mass amount of inflation. I mean, you can add to stupid Richard Nixon's Keynesian stuff. I get all that, but the Fed didn't do anything. I just showed you the M2 supply was fine. I mean, was, in terms of historically, it was just a nice little relative to increase year over year. That not, anyway, it frustrates me. The idea the Fed was what caused this stagflation. What, the Fed had the OPEC stuff? The Fed had all this stuff. And I've done videos on it right before. I'm not going to get to here about the oil and all that stuff. No, the Fed had nothing to do with that. What caused the inflation was the massive increases in energy. And remember, as I always say, 
people, Jimmy Carter wanted clean, we thought there was going to be no more natural gas. We thought we we're on our last legs of natural gas. Jimmy Carter was advocating for coal, clean coal, but still coal nonetheless. And then we wanted nuclear, Maine used to have Maine Yankee as a nuclear plant. And they said, oh, we got to shut it down because the China syndrome is scary. We're so scared. <sighs> so we had less supply and increasing demand. And anytime you have increasing demand and less supply, the prices go up. It's just, that's basic economics. When you have more demand, why? Because we didn't have fracking then, but we opened up the deregulation for oil. All of a sudden you had more uh, supply and then the demand leveled off because people were not saying, hey, I got to get in there. I got to get there. I got to get there. People said, no, I'm pretty comfortable that I'll be able to get a tank of gas or my oil for you know heating my home later on. They weren't just this massive uh, people flushing to the freaking thing to get, I got to get, I got to get it, got to get it. It wasn't like that. And then we had fracking in what, 2004, five, six, and that changed the, the supply of natural gas, which means incredibly low energy prices relative to what they were. I just, I wish economics would get it right. Anyway, it's always earnings, earnings growth. That's always what it is and uh, forever will be. All right, God bless. Love your thoughts. Don't forget to fondle.